Um, they've also sent tens of millions and probably more than that of aid into Gaza. Same with Jordan. Um, they are all, the people there, the people of the Middle East, contrary to the regimes quite frequently, are very pro-Palestinian. In fact, it's the number one issue in Jordan, in Egypt, in Lebanon, in a, the entire Arabian Gulf, Persian Gulf, pa the Palestinian issue is the number one among the people. But it's not reflective in their government policies. In Jordan and Egypt, because they're bordering Palestine and because there's lots of Palestinians, especially in Jordan, it's like 70% Palestinian or more, um, they have to at least show gestures of goodwill. And they've done more than that. They've sent a lot of aid. The Jordanians even had a military hospital. It's still open in Gaza, operating with Jordanian doctors. So they've done a lot. Um, it, it, but could they do more? Yeah, but it's also hypocritical for me as an American to complain about the Jordanian or the Egyptian government when what our government's doing is minuscule in comparison to what their governments are doing to help provide food, medical care, and humanitarian aid. Time coming for me, a dream for me, because Steve Sosaby, I keep telling everybody, Steve Sosaby is the real deal. He makes sure that uh, for 30 plus years, every contribution, the vast, 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 the majority of all the contributions goes to helping kids. Gazan kids, Palestinian kids, to receive free surgeries, free medical care in Gaza, in Egypt, in Jordan, and also especially here in the United States. He told us that right now, as we're sitting here today, 18 young people, 18 kids, uh, are receiving surgical care and medical care here in the United States, thanks to Heal Palestine. And so we're just delighted to have Steve here. We had lunch today with... Uh, Steve and one of the pediatricians in town hoping to build a partnership and to bring kids for surgeries here in Fort Wayne. So that's, we're at the initial stages of that conversation, but it's really kind of a dream of ours at Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. And so we wanna be doing that uh, um, uh, in the near future. So Steve, uh, I'm gonna let you uh, do your presentation and I know you'll kind of sprinkle in some biographical notes uh, uh, along the way. But thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for everything that you do for 30 plus years. We're delighted to welcome you to Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm really honored to be here tonight. It's my first time in Indiana, although I only live next door to you guys. Um, I'm from Ohio, a small town. I'm a Midwesterner just like you. And, um, very honored to be in Indiana. I was very um, happy and very, uh, not surprised, but um, let's say a proud to see the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace exist. I've been in touch with Mike for a couple of years now and his crew, and, and I'm really kind of very much inspired by the work that they're doing and you're all doing supporting them. This is such a critical issue now more than ever. When we first started talking a couple years ago about supporting, you know, working together and trying to kind of address the needs in Palestine, there wasn't a genocide going on as there is today. And things have changed so dramatically and so significantly on the ground there that now more than ever, we feel this very urgent need to really stand up and, and do what we can to make a significant change to U.S. policy, which is, you know, at the end of the day, as Americans, we are responsible for what's happening in Gaza. And we all know that, or we should know that. Those are tax money that's paying for those 2,000 pound now called baby buster bombs, a very sad and disgusting term, but one that is accurate if you follow what's happening in Gaza. That's our money. That's our tax money that goes by the billions every year to Israel to pay for those weapons which are killing innocent civilians by the tens of thousands in Gaza. So this is a very important issue. It is critical. It's not on a far off place that doesn't have any relevance to you. That money could be going to our education system, to our health care, to our infrastructure, to making life better for Americans, not to killing innocent Palestinian children. So I appreciate you guys coming out and I hope my story and the story of the work and, the, and what we're doing as an organization to try to address this crisis, this catastrophe, this injustice, which is incurring on the ground every single day in Gaza, I hope today you'll walk away feeling some sense of hope because I think the biggest challenge we face these days is one of hopelessness um, and, that, and, and helplessness. I mean, those two kind of go together in some way. Um, 
and helplessness is, is probably the biggest challenge for us because we want you guys to realize, and this is what I tell uh, all of our communities where we work, that uh, where, we, where I speak, is that we have so much opportunity and so much ability to make a change in the lives of these kids in Gaza. For those of you that are following the news that comes out of Gaza, and if, if you're, you know, you're not going to get it from the mainstream media, but you don't need to. It's available, it's present. Uh, if you are connected into the right kind of uh, sources, you're going to see every day just the kind of suffering and the kind of um, immense cruelty. It's just the cruelty is, I think, the biggest issue here beyond the human suffering. That it's unprecedented in modern times. We've not seen that. And, um, and so I'll, I'll tell you how I got started. I've been doing this, as Michael said, for, for a long time, um, uh, more than half my life, uh, you know, working and serving um, the Palestinian people and the Palestinian cause. But, you know, I come from a small town in, in northeast Ohio, Kent. Some of you know Kent State. And uh, growing up in that town, I was raised by um, Catholic parents who were liberal Catholics. They believed in progressive politics. They believed always in, that it's our duty and responsibility to stand with um, people who are suffering from injustice and those who are struggling for freedom and those who are being oppressed, especially those who are oppressed by our political system, our economic system. My father was very active in um, social justice issues. We lived in, uh, he was a high school teacher, both my parents, but my father in particular, um, he lived, uh, we lived in a segregated town. And that was not by choice, it was because we were, you know, we had five, he had five kids, he was a high school teacher, my mom was a nurse, so it was, you know, kind of limited income with five children, so we had a house where we could afford a house. That town tended to be 99.9% .9 white, and so my father, in the late 60s, started working to desegregate. There was official segregation in the United States. I'm sure you all are aware of that. Most of you are pretty progressive and understand how racism is such an ingrained institution in this country. My father started to work to desegregate housing in our all-white neighborhood, and it obviously ruffled feathers among those who were not comfortable with diversity um, and integration, and people shot at our house. And one of my earliest memories is my sister's going to elementary school with a police escort. And uh, so we were raised in that environment of uh, progressive politics, of being able to put a, an issue above what your own personal life was, and even in some cases, your own safety. And so I raised with those ideas, and I, you know, it came to me you know, early on as I went to university and, and you know, was working my way through and, and just you know, was very much interested in pol uh, the political issues which were taking place at that time in the mid-'80s. You know, a lot of those issues are, are ones which I think all of us you know, were very much aware of at that time, which was, you know, the, the supporting Contras in Nicaragua, the American support for death squads in, in El Salvador, um, the overthrowing of regimes uh, in Latin America, which were democratic, but may not be aligned economically with the United States, um, the support of the apartheid regime in South Africa, which our country shamelessly uh, supported for many, many decades. Um, those are all issues that students at my university were very active in, but nobody was active on the Palestinian issue. And when the first Palestinian uprising began in the late 80s, it started in December of 1987, um, that's when I started to read, even before that, the history of the Middle East and how this conflict came into being and understood right away that um, the, the core issue here is that the indigenous population of Palestine, the Muslims and Christians, and it, even prior to the Zionist col colonial campaign to settle Palestine with European um, survivors of the Holocaust, the uh, Jewish Arabs of Palestine that the indigenous population, their lack of freedom and rights in their own country, particularly now the Muslims and Christian population, that's the core issue here, the lack of equality, the occupation, and the displacement of millions of Palestinians who continue today to live as refugees, uh, either in Jordan, the West Bank, Gaza, Lebanon, and Syria. So once you understand that's the core issue, then you have to kind of orient yourself on how you can educate fellow Americans, because most Americans aren't aware of that. Um, un unfortunately, it's not really something that is commonly expressed in our media, in our entertainment industry, in the public discourse on this issue. It's always about terrorism, it's always about Israeli security. It's never the root cause, which is the inequality between the Arab population, the indigenous population, and those who came from European, mainly European countries, or other Middle Eastern countries to take and have a more uh, uh, privileged status politically in a land that is not theirs. And that's the core issue here. So with that being said, I started to be active and, and had a chance to go visit Palestine. I went as a student, saw for three weeks what the situation was on the ground. It changed my life, seeing 
the injustice of the Palestinian, the injustice the Palestinians was having imposed upon them, but also their resilience, their humanity, their kindness, their hospitality as part of their culture and as part of their identity. I came back, finished university, and then went back to work as a journalist. And my intention of working as a journalist was not to start a career in journalism. I didn't study journalism. I studied international relations. Um, so my intention was, as an activist, to share the stories that I felt Americans were not being educated on, the common stories of, of, of people every day in the West Bank and in Gaza who were enduring such extreme hardships that Americans had no idea. Did we know that thousands of Palestinians were being imprisoned without trial, without even knowing what the charges were against them? That torture was, even and this is in the late 80s during the first uprising, that the Israeli measures to, con com to crush this popular uprising, which included the entire Palestinian population, which was Christian and Muslim, which was the, the elite class, the educated class, uh, the, the merchants, and also the refugees, and people who were the peasants, the fellahin, which is an Arabic term for peasants, people from the land. Um, all of those were in unity, and they were all rising up to resist, and for the most part, peacefully, um, the Israeli occupation, and they were being crushed through these measures which Americans had no idea. This, uh, this use of brutality, this use of force, this use of, of violence against them. So. Having gone there and seen that and, and being part of a human rights delegation of college students, I walked away after three weeks of that experience very much determined to, to apply, uh, to go back and try to do something. I was young, I was in my early 20s, I didn't have really a path in life that I thought um, that was clear to me. I knew I wanted to do something that was important in the sense that it, was, uh, uh, it gave me a sense of purpose. I wanted to do something that stood in solidarity with people who were struggling for freedom. I recognized very early on uh, that how privileged I was as an American, first and foremost, as a male, as a white man. I mean, that's the jackpot, right? We've hit the jackpot. If you're born in 1965 as a white American male, you have reached the highest level of privilege that you could possibly have in the history of mankind. But that comes with a responsibility. I mean, you di I didn't earn this, you know, this privilege. It came with you know, the structures of injustice and the structures of privilege in this country that is built, up, that this country was founded on. So I wanted to dedicate my life to working for equality, working for justice, and the Palestinian issue came to me as one that I felt was important. I understood the issue, it was, I mentioned before, the lack of equality and freedom and justice for an indigenous population in their own land, being denied by our government. Even in the late, you know, we know that from the, the this founding of the State of Israel until today, our government has been the main benefactor of Israel's continued occupation and uh, displacement of the indigenous population of Palestinians. That's our responsibility, and as an American, therefore, I have a more important moral responsibility to stand with the Palestinians and to work for them than I have for other issues that are not as related to my country's policies and our government's policies. So I went back to work as a journalist, and I wanted to share the stories of everyday people. And what I would do is, you know, I just slept on people's couches. I didn't have money, of course. This was before the internet, so I was working as a journalist for some kind of Palestinian magazines or Arab. They, they weren't Palestinian Americans, they were American magazines that were covering the Middle East, the Washington Report. I'm sure many of you know that magazine. I wrote for them all the time, and I loved it. It was a great uh, opportunity for me to learn how to write, uh, to use communication, develop communication skills, but also to, to start to share these stories. And as I traveled throughout the West Bank and Gaza as a young person and learned started to learn the language, started to learn the, the um, geography and, uh, and how to get around and how to interact with people and understand the issue um, you know, as, in a kind of very grassroots way, riding buses, sitting in taxis, walking through refugee camps, sleeping in people's homes. You know, I became very much connected to the issue. Um, and one day, I heard about a boy in the hospital in Makassar, Makassar Hospital on the Mount of Olives in East Jerusalem. For many of you who have been to Jerusalem, you know that that's the place you go to look down on the old city and you have this beautiful scene. Well, there's a famous Palestinian hospital there called Makassar. And I heard about this boy in Makassar Hospital who had his legs blown off, a hand blown off, and an eye blown off from an Israeli bomb. He was in, from, in the West Bank town of Hebron, which is really the main Palestinian, the only Palestinian city where Israeli settlements are inside the populated area. And most of the Israeli settlements, as you know, one of the main obstacles to any kind of two-state solution is the fact that there are hundreds of Israeli, illegal Israeli settlements, illegal not in my book, by the International Court of Justice, by international law, uh, and hundreds of thousands of illegal Israeli settlers in the West Bank, but the only town in which they actually are in a populated Palestinian city, other than East Jerusalem, is Hebron, is in Al-Khalil, which is the southernmost 
city. So there's always, it's a very contentious area. It's a very tense area. And this family was eating lunch one day and a passing group of soldiers threw an anti-tank grenade at them. It exploded. The entire family was injured, but this boy bore the brunt of the injury. And that's when I visited him in the hospital. Okay. I don't know what I did here. Okay. So this is me in 1990. Uh, this is the boy who I met. I, I had this uh, old Russian camera. I can't remember what it was. And I only took one photo in its entire existence. It was a piece of crap, and I couldn't get it to work. And that's the photo it took for me one day. And I, I used to be a landscaper. That's how I paid my way through college. And, uh, and I still, and I was broke, so I used to work as a landscaper from spring to fall as a seasonal job. I'm sure it's the same in Indiana. And then in the winter, I would go to Palestine and work. So this was like in April, I took this photo of this boy, Mansoor, and brought it back uh, with me to, um, to Ohio. And I showed it to a surgeon, a Lebanese American orthopedic surgeon who was very well established in the Akron medical community and asked him, hey, I saw this boy, he's a cute kid. I had this really strong connection with him. You know, he's got this energy about him, this pride, even though he's maimed, you can see he lost his hand, he lost both his legs, he also lost an eye from this terrible bombing. But he was proud, his one finger was the victory sign. That's not a peace sign, it's a victory sign. Victory, peace comes after equality, it doesn't come before. So he held up, you know, he was like many Palestinians, very proud. And, um, and so uh, I'd say, I gave this photograph to this doctor and he called me the next day and said, bring him. Well, we've arranged everything for him for free. And I was, I was shocked, I didn't realize that that was, I've never had no, I had no idea what that meant. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. But I started from that, I brought him over. His sister was also injured, I included her. They came to the Cleveland Akron area, it was in the media, it was on the front page of the Plain Dealer. They had a press conference, the hospital that was treating him. Um, they had a press conference, uh, it was on the front page of the Akron Beacon Journal. Millions of Americans in that media uh, market, um, and he was on television, the local news. So for the first time, Americans were seeing exactly what I was trying to do as a journalist, which was to educate my fellow countrymen about the things that I saw in Palestine, which is first and foremost, that there were thousands of children being killed and injured in the first uprising in Palestine by the Israeli army, which was supplied and paid for by the American government, by our tax money. So that was important for me. The most important thing was to get this boy walking again. He, if I had not done anything, he would not have gotten legs. He would still be in a wheelchair. His life would have taken, obviously, a different course. But by bringing him and getting him the best quality care that he could possibly get, he still has the same core prosthetic limbs that he had over 30 years ago. I saw him not long ago in, in the West Bank. Um, that I, it changed his life, but it also that's the most important reason we brought him is to get him medical care. But educating Americans, I realized this is a great way for me as an activist to help people, to show my solidarity and my support with these people that felt very much abandoned, that felt that the world doesn't care about their struggle, about their uh, uh, the, their displacement, their occupation, the injustice that they've endured, historical injustice. The world didn't care; it was turning a blind eye to these kind of uh, incidents. Uh, so I would be able to show them, hey, we stand with you. There are millions of people, tens of millions, billions of people all over the world, including in this country, who stand with you and are, are by your side. And when your children get injured, we're going to help pick them up. We're going to show them the love and compassion that they need. That's what I wanted to do. And I wanted to educate Americans, but I also wanted to organize our communities here to be more involved, to have a stronger hand. I'm an activist. That's how I got started. That's my intention. It remains today. I'm an activist, but I use my activism in a humanitarian way to have an impact on the lives of people there, but also it's such a basic issue in Palestine that even humanitarian work is political. Even clean water is political. Even education is political. Even going uh, to a hospital and getting medical care, that's political. That's the way the occupation, that's the way the Israelis have made this issue. So if you're going to get children medical care, if you're going to provide a village clean water, if you're going to try to provide medical treatment and medication, you're doing something that is a political act. That's not my decision. That's how they define the issue. But I'm happy to do it. I don't feel like I'm. I don't feel like standing with the Palestinians and providing injured children medical treatment is a political act. It shouldn't be. It's a humanitarian act. But in this case, it is political, and I'm proud to do it, and I'll do it until the day I die. Um, so this is me in 1990 with his little brother. I went to visit them in their home in Hebron. They lived in just basically a shell of cement, and they all slept on the floor. And it's, the poverty, you know, was immense. But they were good, kind people, and you know. Any food they had, they, they were, I was the first to get it on a plate before anybody else. So um, truly uh, a life-changing experience for me to bring it, bring this boy in. And then he, we started to see so many other kids who needed medical care and couldn't get it. 
uh, there. And I start, I went, when he came back for, to Palestine, of course, word spread around. It's not a huge area of the West Bank. It's probably the size of a few counties here in, in, uh, in Indiana. Um, and so people hear about this boy who went to America without legs and he came back walking and hey, who did it? How did it happen? It was this American journalist. And they started, bring, they heard about me, they found me you know, in the country and they would start bringing me other kids. So I said, this is my contribution. This is the way I can serve a struggle that I feel is having some kind of impact. So I started arranging treatment for these other kids. Then I realized I needed an organization to do it. I couldn't do it by myself. I was just a kid. So I started an organization. I'm going to try to go to the next slide here, but if you do that, that there we go. I started another organization, and um, you can do both of these slides, by the way. Click that. There we go. I started an organization, and you know, like I said, it was in the media, um, and, and I was very, uh, you know, in, inspired by the fact that we could get these kids exposed. Uh, I started an organization called Palestine Children's Relief Fund, which still exists today, PCRF. It's, it's one of the bigger organizations now. And I, uh, and I met this woman here uh, in, the, in the black and white polka dot dress. Her name is Huda Al Masri. And we fell in love at first sight. It was like the second I saw her, I knew there was some kind of spiritual connection. I know that sounds corny, but it's true. And uh, she felt the same way as she said, as she said that. I'm not sure if that's true. But in any case, uh, we fell in love. And even though um, you know, she was Muslim, and I was raised, as I told you, in a Catholic family, which wasn't Catholic anymore because my parents got divorced. so. I won't go into that, but in any case, um, um, you know, we, we, we just fell in love, and love is universal. So uh, I was, I think, the first American guy to ever, the first non-Palestinian or non-Arab to marry a Palestinian Arab woman in the West Bank. I, I stand by that record, and I'm going to continue to make that claim until somebody can come and disprove it. That was in 1991. We got married. We fell in love, and she was a social worker. How we met was I was in Jerusalem. She heard about this American guy that was taking injured kids to the states for treatment. She had all these injured kids because she worked for the YMCA. They had a program of, of providing social care for injured children uh, during the first intifada. She wanted me to review these kids. She had no idea who I was. She met me, we fell in love. We had courtship for about a year and then we got married. And then um, we built the organization together. She would take care of the kids and I would um, um, uh, run the organization and build the organization. We were a team. Um, you might know this woman here on the left, that's Hanana Shrawi. Um, if you don't know her, just Google her name and go uh, watch some of her talks. She's probably the greatest spokesperson for the Palestinian cause, extremely articulate, professor of English language, still today um, out there fighting the good fight, somebody who um, I have great respect for. I, I'm a friend, we're friends. Uh, but this is where she would come early on um, to help uh, uh, support our organization in the early years to get started. She came and spoke at some of our events. Uh, uh, over 30 years ago. And this boy in the middle here, I want to tell his story because it, you know, it's, it's re relevant for today. This boy was nine years old, his name's Munir Najjar, and he was shot in the leg back in uh, 1989 in the Jabalia refugee camp in Gaza, which is almost completely destroyed today. And Munir, uh, I brought him to Ohio. He had orthopedic surgery there on the back of his leg. And, um, and we became friends. And he, he had a brother in South Carolina, and he went and stayed with him for a while, learned English, finished high school, moved back to Gaza, uh, got married, had kids. And I would, when I went to visit Gaza, we would meet. His English was great. And he would go around with me, and we'd visit people, visit kids. He would help translate and some of that other stuff. Um, and just, just a really great kid. Uh, but uh, in, uh, back in, uh, in December, um, he did, when the Israelis forced the evacuation, tried to force everybody in the north to go south, and a lot of people didn't go because they had nowhere to go or they were afraid to cross lines. Maybe they were active politically, whatever. He didn't go. He stayed in Jabalia with his family. And one day the Israeli army, 100 soldiers came to his house in Jabalia camp just last December. Um, he must have known something was up. Uh, they paid him a visit. This was not some kind of running gun battle. They came into his home. He was in his bedroom with his mother, um, sitting on the bed. And the soldiers came into the room and they shot him in the back of the head and killed him in front of his mother, um, assassinated him. Munir Najjar, a friend of mine, a kid I took care of at the age of nine um, who had to uh, suffer this terrible, terrible injustice. So these are some of the stories. I've had 10 kids that I've brought for treatment. So in short, I brought, not me, but the organization I founded. And until today, as Michael said, we have 18 injured kids from Gaza here now. We have brought from Gaza over 800 kids for medical care in this country in the past 30 years, over 2,000 total, including the West Bank, some from Iraq, some from Syria, mostly Palestinian and mostly from Gaza. 
um, and he was one of them. And I, we've lost 10 kids. Just last week, another boy uh, was killed that had gone to Atlanta in 2019 for a leg. He had been shot then in 2019. And then we went to Atlanta, got a new leg, was back in Gaza, and they bombed his home and killed him and his wife. And his only surviving member of his family is his baby uh, daughters. So these are all the stories that we, um, that we have in this organization. I founded the organization. My wife, uh, you could see, we were just starting this. That's my oldest daughter, Dima, there on the left. And we just started do, building an organization. And we, you know, we're lear learning through work. You know, you get kids out for treatment. You learn what works best. How is the best way to engage the community? And we started doing humanitarian work, distributing humanitarian aid wherever it was needed. We started bringing doctors over. We started to do the first medical teams into Gaza in 1995. That was us. And, uh, and we, you know, I've sent thousands of volunteer doctors from all over the world into Gaza in all different specialties and the West Bank, um, and was able to build up programs there uh, and provide tens of thousands of children specialized surgery care that they otherwise wouldn't get. So that's how the organization was developing. But in 2008, on Christmas Day, my wife was diagnosed with leukemia um, and uh, went back to Cleveland, got, we went into University Hospital, started the treatment for leukemia, AML, and uh, on July 15th of 2009, unfortunately, even though we had two daughters together, Dima and my, at that time, my two and a half year old daughter, Jenna, um, she, couldn't, she couldn't beat it. Um, and as I was t telling the story last night, in December of 2008, the Israelis did one of their first, which in comparison now is nothing, but at that time was a massive military attack on the Gaza Strip called, called Operation Cast Lead. And at that time, we had never seen that kind of precedent, unprecedented use of fighter planes and bombings and tanks before the Israeli army would go in and they would shoot people. And you would never see tanks, you would never see the use of, of bombs from jet planes. But now in, in December of 2008, they started using that kind of force and the casualties were massive. And my wife, just being diagnosed with AML, was in a hospital bed and her hair was starting to fall out. She had chemo coming into her veins. Um, she was starting to get mouth sores, all the things that people with undergoing chemo have to endure. And she was on her computer every day working for the organization to help get these injured kids who were being injured at the exact same moment uh, in Gaza out for treatment. And after she passed away in July of 2009, God rest her soul, um, there were probably 10 kids in the US that had arrived uh, from Gaza for treatment thanks to her efforts while she was dying from cancer. Just an amazing woman, just an incredible humanitarian, an incredible person, and I was very honored to be her husband for 17 years. Um, to honor her, we opened a uh, cancer department in Beit Jala Hospital. Beit Jala is the town next to Bethlehem. They're kind of all merged now. There's three Christian towns just uh, south of Jerusalem called Beit Suhur, Bethlehem, of course, the famous town where Jesus was born, and then Beit Jala. And uh, in Beit Jala, that was where the Ministry of Health had decided to develop pediatric or develop cancer care. Well, I was after after my wife passed, I moved back to Palestine with my two daughters to, because her family there could help me uh, with raising them while I was running the organization. I wanted to continue to work and to um, continue to um, to help kids and carry her name and carry her legacy and build the organization even stronger. Um, and the only way I could do that was to move my family back there on the ground and be directly on the ground building the organization and my kids um, staying connected to her family and continuing that identity. They were half American, half Palestinian. Uh, it's very easy to raise American kids in this world, anywhere in the world. Our culture is so pervasive with media, with entertainment, with everything. It's very easy to raise kids who are American, but it's not so easy to raise your kids with that other identity from their mother. So we moved back to the West Bank and, uh, and we built a, I decided, you know, my wife, um, if we had never met, and she uh, had never had the opportunity to go to America and, uh, and get treatment there, she still would have gotten cancer. Like it had nothing to do with any environmental factors. Um, that's how leukemia works. And, but had she just stayed in Palestine, the quality of care that she would have got would have been immensely inferior and she would have suffered much greater. She suffered greatly as it was, but had she just stayed in, Gaza, in the West Bank, the lack of proper care would have been immense. So I decided to do something about it. At that time we did a study we found there was no cancer treatment at all for, ch for children in the West Bank. Every child with cancer had to go outside of the West Bank after getting military permission, and that permission is denied. True for kids in Gaza as well, and that level of denial by the Israeli military on patients, including kids with cancer, it was very high. It's over 50%. Um, so we built a cancer department. We did a fundraising campaign. I never had a vision in my mind that the organization could take on large, large infrastructural projects which could transform the health sector there into providing better services within their own uh, ministry. 
Um, but by doing this project and building this cancer department in Huda's name, we also built, built a healing garden right outside the hospital where the kids with cancer could play. We, we provided social work for them, mental health therapy, uh, tutoring. We want it to be a very holistic approach to treating these kids. We, real we opened it in uh, April of 2013, and it was a huge accomplishment. It was a massive um, success in the sense that um, you know, now children who previously had to go beg and beg the Israeli military to let them go with one member of their family for this month-long, two-month-long cancer treatment in an Israeli hospital or in the Jordanian hospital now to be treated in their own uh, country, by, surrounded by their own family members and treated by Palestinian doctors. So we're very proud of that accomplishment and that's where I realized this organization could have a much bigger impact. So um, switch to the next slide. If you don't mind. So then, in, uh, you know, as the organization grew, um, it became bigger. It became having a big. We opened a cancer department in Gaza on November 5th. That was bombed by the Israeli military one month into the genocide. Um, we continued to send medical teams there. I had a vision of really transforming the health sector in Gaza. We we built a, uh, you know, we had 43 different medical committees and subcommittees which were focusing on different uh, aspects of the health system in Gaza, where and in the West Bank, where we could identify gaps and deficiencies and attack them. So there's a lack of um, uh, proper cardiac care in Gaza, we built a cath lab. There's a lack of neonatal services. We expanded the neonatal services that were existing with more beds, we trained more nurses, we provided more support, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so we really were starting to have a tremendous impact on the health sector in Gaza. The organization became very big, very successful. Um, uh, but then the genocide started in October 7th, as you all know. And um, therefore, the whole health system in Gaza became overwhelmed and then became attacked. It became under siege, and the Israelis started attacking the different hospitals. They started with Hamad Hospital in northern Gaza, which was built by the Qatari government, a beautiful hospital. That's where we were building a program for artificial limbs. In Gaza, we were the only organization really taking on the development of those of those services. That was attacked and that was destroyed. And you can Google Hamad Hospital today. There's some photos where the Israeli army just wrote all kind of graffiti all over the walls. They spray painted the Star of David and all kinds of derogatory uh, terms in Hebrew. Um, so they just looted the hospitals. And then they moved down to Rantisi Hospital where we built a cancer department and opened that in February of 2019. We had built a beautiful cancer department there in Gaza. An amazing, amazing accomplishment. The jewel of the health system in Gaza was the pediatric cancer department we opened there. On November 5th, as I mentioned just a second ago, that was bombed. And all of those kids were forced into the street. There wasn't any kind of like proper evacuation of cancer children or of the 6,000 people who were seeking refuge around the hospital hoping it wouldn't be bombed. Uh, all of the hospitals in Gaza were just surrounded by people because they were just so fearful of their lives. They thought that was the most, that was the safest place. And actually we saw on October 17th where the Baptist hospital in Gaza was bombed and 400 people were killed. Uh, that was an Israeli bomb. They said it was a, a wayward missile by Islamic Jihad. That's not true. Um, so 400, even those people who were seeking refuge around a hospital um, were killed. So when the Israelis came to Rantisi Hospital, they just forced everybody into the street, including our cancer patients and they just disappeared. They just, like, people were, were running for their lives uh, behind the barrel of a tank. So that hospital was closed, then they attacked Shifa Hospital, as you all know. That was the main referral hospital in the Gaza Strip. I know the place very well. That was closed down. Many people were killed, including doctors. There's been over 400 doctors and nurses killed in Gaza. Anyway, by, uh, by the end of the year, I decided to start another organization. I was not happy with the direction the organization I founded and built was taking. The board had come in, there were some issues of transparency, there were some issues in proper governance. I didn't feel like I could maximize my 30 years experience of serving the Palestinians, especially during this time of genocide, in the most effective way with the kind of challenges and conflict I was having with my board of directors. So I said, I just want to, I just want to get back to doing the work I started PCRF doing um, and the ability to implement programs. I don't ever want to have to go through a long bureaucratic approval process to feed a child or to treat a child or to help somebody who needs help. If I have a team on the ground and there's a homeless family and we can build them a shelter, I want them to build the shelter. I don't want to have to go through an approval process. I don't have to, it, okay, approval in the sense that you should have the funds for it, it should be transparent, you're not doing anything wrong, but just get it done. That's my management style, that's my leadership style, and I was unable to do that any longer. In fact, I was just asked to kind of step aside from a leadership position 
And I said, I, I don't feel that there's any reason for that. On the contrary, now's the time more than ever that you want people who have the experience and the leadership skills and the ability, proven ability, to maximize their opportunity to have an impact in the most effective way. My board saw that differently, so I started another organization because I'm committed to the issue. I'm committed to the mission. I'm committed to the original vision of building an organization which is completely 100% transparent, an organization that is based on grassroots support, but also effectively addresses the needs on the ground in the most efficient and the most effective way. So that's why we started Heal Palestine. Now, Heal stands for H stands for health, E stands for education, aid stands for, uh, A stands for aid, and then L stands for leadership. And those are areas I always wanted to have an impact on. I always was looking at the um, education system in Gaza or in Palestine and saying, there's so much we could do, there's so much potential. Um, and even in the cancer departments, so in the last couple of years of my work with PCRF, they took away the tutoring of cancer kids. They said, we don't do education. I said, that's ridiculous. It costs $12,000 a year to provide tutoring for kids with cancer who are missing school. Like if you have leukemia and you're eight years old and you're, you know, you're in the second grade and uh, you're gonna miss three months of school, instead of having to go back and take second grade over again, let's just bring tutors in and let's keep these kids up to a level that when they get treatment and they're healthy, they can continue on uh, in their education. That was my vision and that's one of the reasons I left. There's many reasons and I'm not trying to go into that now. But that's an example where I believe strongly that education is an important part of uh, helping support and serve the Palestinian cause, just like the health system is. And I always felt there was much more that can be done and should be done and needs to be done, especially in this genocide today. So education is one of the reasons we started HEAL. And aid was one of the reasons because there's a lot more that's obviously needed now on the ground. And then finally leadership, where I think in the post-genocidal phase, in the next phase when we have to rebuild Gaza, there's two types of rebuilding that's gonna go on. There's the physical infrastructure where there's gonna be billion dollar contracts signed with you know, all of these international construction firms that are gonna come in with their bulldozers. God willing, I mean, I hope so, we need to. Any of you who have not witnessed or seen the, what the destruction of Gaza looks like, just Google it today. There was a UN team that went in recently and did a video of Northern Gaza and it looks horrific. There's not a single building standing. Um, so that all can, needs to be rebuilt, that's a high priority. But that's easy. That's where governments come in. That's where the Saudis with their money, or the Emiratis, or the Americans, or the Europeans, they come in and they rebuild schools, hospitals, homes, um, you know, the, all of the entire, the water treatment plants which have been bombed, the desalination plant in Gaza which has been bombed. Um, but for us, the other type of rebuilding is the lives of the people there. And that's where I think governments should not be involved because they don't have the ability to come in as kind of a, take that human entity Take a child whose life has been destroyed either by the injuries that they've sustained or the loss of their parents and their family members and heal them and rebuild their lives through a mentorship program by connecting them to people outside who can give them opportunities to rebuild their lives, to have a future, to not be dependent on governments or on uh, aid agencies or charitable contributions just to get food as they grow into adulthood. We want them to be independent. We want them to have meaningful, purposeful lives. They deserve that. And that's where our organization in the L part of HEAL is going to have the biggest impact. We're going to build a leadership mentorship program that's going to identify these kids and put them into a system or into a process in which we start to heal them from the early ages up until the point where they're able to be educated and, and move forward in their lives. So that's why, that's how HEAL came into creation. Um, and since then, I've, I've since remarried. Uh, I should say this because my wife is one of the co-founders, my new wife is one of the co-founders of HEAL, just like my first wife was one of the founders of, of PCRF. And she's a pediatric oncologist. She works at St. Jude. Her family's from Sudan. She speaks Arabic. Um, and she was raised in the DC area. And she's an incredible woman as well. I've been very blessed to find two amazing women who are so much smarter and so much better people than I am, better persons. Um, and she's now very much active in evacuating, injured, uh, evacuating kids with cancer as a pediatric oncologist on behalf of St. Jude Hospital. They, she's been in, leading the evacuation of about 180 cancer patients out of Gaza. She did an evacuation of 11 kids last two weeks ago with the State Department and with the governments of Jordan um, and is now working on another evacuation, but I think that that's stalled because the Israelis have applied new restrictions that are not allowing the mothers to leave. I can talk a little bit more about that now. That's Heal Palestine, that's how we got started. So, next slide. I, I don't, there we go. 
So we all, we all know what the impact is of what's happening on the ground there. If you're a, a, a 16 year old child in Gaza, 16, I have a 14, I have a 17 year old daughter, her birthday to be 18 is tomorrow. Um, if she was born in Gaza, um, she would have been through six wars. So, and, and by the way, if you're 16 year old in, in Gaza, 16 and under is 40% of the population. 21 and under is 50%. So it's a very young population that they've known nothing but war, nothing but hardship, nothing but conflict, nothing but death, destruction, siege, and closure. They've not traveled outside. They see the world outside on their phones. They've not traveled outside of Gaza. They've seen nothing about but the different bombing and attacks. And, you know, you can see here, if you're born uh, as a refugee, you're born a refugee, 70% of Gaza is, are refugees from 1948. And what that means is that in 1948, when the State of Israel was created, they forcibly displaced the vast majority of Palestinians from Palestine. 750,000 Palestinians were forced into refugee camps. Gaza has eight of them. And they're the huge, massive refugee camps, from Jabalia through uh, to the beach camp, down to the central camps of Magazi, Braid, Dirabala, and Nusrat, down to Han Yunus and Rafa. Those are the eight refugee camps in Gaza. There are 100,000 people, or were, until the genocide massive open sewage people who for generations were waiting for their rights to return to their homeland to their original homes and which were denied under international law refugees have a right to return home the israelis have blocked that with the support of our government so these kids are born mainly as refugees the first assault uh you know was um, at the age of two uh you know they survived the 22-day assault second one eight-day assault which killed 33 children the third assault 50 days, which killed 1,500 children, oh, were orphans, uh, uh, and killed 2,251. The Great Return March, which I mentioned before, that boy who went to Atlanta who was killed last week, Mohammed, he was shot by a sniper from over 400 meters and lost his leg in the Great Return March, which we treated many of those kids as well. This is just to give you a sign or an indication of what children in Gaza have gone through. This genocide that began on October 7th is not the beginning of the Palestinian conflict. It is for a lot of people in this country. It awakened a lot of people, especially young people, who were shocked by what they saw. But for some of the people who've been with in this issue for a long time, and, and in this room there's many of you, this has been going on, especially in Gaza. And the fact that there's an entire generation of young people there that have just been exposed to conflict, 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 what does that mean psychologically for that population? How do we repair the damage that's been done to them psychologically? How do you deal with post-traumatic stress, when it's not post, it's current traumatic stress. The source of the stress and anxiety and trauma, psychological trauma that these kids are enduring, is constant. It's every single day. You can't adequately address it through professional therapy, counseling, support, while it's ongoing, because the source remains the bombing, the siege, the occupation, the poverty, the displacement, the hunger, the death and destruction that's all around you. Um, so that's one of the most important points is that this generation of young people are so traumatized that it's going to be such a challenge for anyone to come in and try to have a positive impact in rebuilding their lives. Even if we heal their bodies, healing their minds is the biggest challenge that we're going to face. Next slide, please. Um, what we're doing in HEAL, the most important thing we're doing right now is addressing two main areas, which is health and aid. The education is critical, but Israel's bombed and destroyed over 60% of the schools in Gaza, and the rest of them are full of displaced people from the north or who have their homes bombed. So there are no schools and there's no classrooms, and not a single day of class has taken place since October 7th. They blew up and destroyed the two universities in Gaza, the Islamic University and the Al-Azhar University, which were producing very high-level graduates in medicine, in physics, in science, in education, um, the Gaza people are among, the Palestinian people, especially in Gaza, are among the most educated people in the Middle East and in the world. Those two universities were bombed and destroyed, not in a running battle with the resistance at all. They were placed detonations around the school. You can Google this. It's like it's not, it's not me saying it. Go watch how the Israelis blew up the Islamic University in Gaza. Watch how they blew up Al-Azhar University in Gaza. It was premeditated, and it's, that's how genocide works. Okay? You destroy not only the people, physical beings, and we've seen 17,000 children killed in Gaza since last October, almost 2% of the population. But you destroy the livelihoods of the people, the infrastructure, the ability to survive, the ability to rebuild a society. There's no more universities in Gaza. The schools are almost completely destroyed. The water 
the sanitation system is destroyed, the, the, the desalination plants are destroyed. Why are you targeting these areas? They're not military targets. We know that the Israelis can do precision bombing. We saw it two weeks ago in Tehran when they killed and assassinated the head of Hamas in, his, in, a, hotel, in a guest house. There was no more collateral damage. They just like pinpointed and assassinated him. How is it that you're unable to protect these institutions unless your intention is to destroy them and that's what their intention is. This isn't a secret, it's not my opinion, it's facts. And the more we recognize it, the more we should be comfortable, as ugly as the term is to use genocide, it's such an ugly term, it makes me uncomfortable every time I say it, there's no other word for what's happening today. And it's being paid for and supported by each of us in this room. Every single one of us who pays taxes is, provide, is behind the starvation and destruction and killing, murder of the Palestinian people. It's our responsibility. And all of us, as soon as we recognize that, hopefully we'll take action to try to do something about it. We're running food kitchens in Gaza right now. People are starving. Hunger is a real thing. 80% of the population there goes on one meal a day. 80%. We had, there were, where, I'm, I'm gonna say this, because I say it a lot, I'm just gonna, re I always remind myself, it's such an important point. Where in modern history have children been starved and there's hundreds of trucks of food waiting for them two miles away across the border and the denial of that food, con those cool food convoys from entering to feed these starving children, when did that ever happen in modern history? But it happened and it's happening today in Gaza because there's hundreds of trucks in the Egyptian side of the, of the border full of food that can feed people there and the Israelis deny them entry into Gaza. When has that ever happened? Did it happen in Iraq? No. Did it happen in that brutal war in Syria? It did not. Using food as a military tool, as a political tool to starve children is so beyond the scope of moral thought and the ability to even convey how evil that is that I can't properly express it, but I don't think I need to. I think everybody in this room understands how evil that is, to starve children when food is readily available. It wasn't a hurricane, it wasn't a famine, it wasn't a, a, a tsunami or an earthquake that prevented food from reaching these people. It was the decision of military leaders, of political leaders, who are strongly allied and support, aligned with and supported by our leadership in this country. It's our responsibility. When children starve in Gaza, it's because the American government allowed it to happen. That's the reality. We're running a food kitchen, right? It was in Rafa. It had to be moved to Dirabala because the Israelis invaded Rafa in early May. We feed nearly 4,000 people a day for free. We're trying to open a food kitchen in the northern Gaza with the support of the World Central Kitchen. We're trying to open another one in, Cent in Han Yunis. We want to open as many kitchens as we can. The problem is getting food on a regular basis. We have one kitchen open that we're getting food from the World Central Kitchen. We hope to get more supplies because we have a great team on the ground there that cooks food and distributes it. Um, next slide, please. In the kitchen, this was an early photograph, by the way. The kitchens we run now look a lot cleaner and a lot better than that. Um, so as I mentioned before, like genocide in the modern age, it's not, it's not your grandpa's genocide in Europe. Um, we're all, nobody saw the death camps of Auschwitz and uh, Treblinka and all of these terrible, terrible atrocities which were committed against the Jewish people of Europe. The Germans said even a mile away they didn't know. Of course that was a lie. They could smell the burning bodies. But the fact is that it wasn't visual. You couldn't pick up any kind of a device and watch a father hold up his dead son's body with his brains blown out as we saw two days ago uh, uh, visually on, on social media. We all know what's happening today. So genocide in the modern age is something different. It makes us more complacent, in the, or not more complacent, more complicit in this, what's happening on the ground. It shouldn't make you complacent. This bombing here is when they bombed uh, and killed uh, 400 people in Jabalia camp. Look at the size of destruction of this bomb here. That you all see. That was, they did that to kill one Hamas commander, by the way. Um, and, and killed 400 people. How many of those were children? How many of those bodies would never be found? So we talk about 17,000 dead children in Gaza. Those are the only ones that we found that bodies could be identified. There's literally thousands of children. They think the number is 9,000 more of children in Gaza whose bodies have not been found because they're under these kind of rubble, under this kind of massive destruction. So think, so the, probably is much, the number is much higher. So since October, over 
of the children in Gaza have been bombed to death by bombs that were supplied by our government. Two percent. That's genocide by any definition. And we're not counting the children who died from the lack of clean water, from the lack of uh, inaccessible medicine because the borders are closed and the Israelis will not allow medication to come in or doctors to come in, the lack of anesthesia, the lack of pain medication. We have a 14-year-old girl in Chicago right now, double amputee, beautiful young Palestinian Gazan girl who had both her legs blown off last October. And the doctors had to amputate without anesthesia her limbs because anesthesia has run out and new supplies were denied from entering the Gaza Strip. That's genocide. In the modern world, it's even worse now because we have, um, the Israelis are using AI technology to target people who they consider to be activists. And we've seen who these activists are. Uh, there's poets, there's teachers, there's writers, there's doctors, and there's journalists in addition to people they consider resistance fighters. So they're using AI to target their homes and target their families, and they've said so openly that they're willing to kill an entire family to get one activist, one resistance fighter, one person they seem to be, consider a security threat. That's the modern world we live in today, that AI is driving this system of assassination and killings that, again, it's on us, it's what's being done with our money, and it's being supported by our leaders. Next slide, please. This is the kitchen that we are running. Um, as I mentioned before, over 500,000 Gazans now, 500,000 are suffering from now malnutrition. That's a UN title. So Heal Palestine, we're running these kitchens. We have these young guys. The kitchen looks much better than the other photos because that was in the early stages where we were just putting things together and trying to feed people. Now we're doing this every day. Um, we're trying to run it in the most sanitized way and to provide healthy meals whenever we can get any kind of protein, we provide it. We just did a massive distribution of chicken recently. Um, and we've been supporting shipments of food. If you follow us on social media, you'll see that we have this massive warehouse full that we're distributing this week of food in northern Gaza, which has been really the area of famine. Uh, not famine, because that suggests that uh, somehow it's a, uh, uh, a nature-produced uh, uh, issue as a result of, of massive starvation in the north. Next slide, please. Um, our global healing program is the one that I'm, that we're really active on right now for many reasons. As I said before, um, I brought the first injured child to Pal from Palestine here in 1990, uh, the boy I showed you at the beginning, how I got started building this, uh, this kind of life of, of support for the Palestinian people. And um, so when, the, uh, when we started Heal Palestine, we knew that we could bring these kids over and get them treatment for free. We don't pay for their treatment in this country. We can get them free uh, either in private hospitals. We have a girl at the Cleveland Clinic. We had a boy who had his head, uh, uh, he had a head injury and was missing part of his skull. He was treated at Wolfson Hospital in Jackson, Jacksonville, Florida. That's a private hospital. Uh, we've had kids treated in, in private, and also the Shriners, great institution. Um, they provide free orthopedic care for us. That's the girl here who had her leg amputated. Um, this boy here is still stuck in Gaza. I've arranged treatment for him. Uh, in San Francisco, but he, his entire family was killed. He has to come with his uncle. He was supposed to travel two weeks ago with the evacuation of cancer patients, but at the last minute was denied. His name was taken off the list. This girl is a case we just found. She's part of our mental health program uh, in Gaza, and she uh, will be one of our patients as soon as we're able to get her out uh, for treatment. And this boy, Mohammed, just came. I just uh, was welcomed him in Houston on thir uh, Tuesday. He arrived, um, and he is a quadruple amputee. He lost both his hands. He only has two fingers here, and both his legs above the knee. So it's going to be a huge, huge challenge for this boy to walk again because the prosthetic limbs have to have a knee joint to give him mobility. There Today, fortunately, they have great prosthetic limbs that can get him walking again. But what's more challenging for us is helping to repair his spirit, helping to heal his broken heart, his, he knows, he's 14, he knows what lays ahead for him in his life of every day getting up and putting on artificial legs. He didn't do anything wrong, he was just a child in Gaza. But you can see from his eyes how, just, I don't know how to describe that, the, the sadness, the, the element of just overall kind of depression, um, which all of us under, can understand. 
he's now in Houston. I just spoke with his host family today. I, uh, they're taking him to a soccer match tomorrow. The whole community came out and greeted him on Tuesday and welcomed him. And this is what we're doing. When our kids come, we have hundreds of people come to the airport and let them know their love. They, they let them know that we're with them, that this massive killing of children is not something that we as human beings tolerate. And we want to reverse this, this idea among Palestinians in particular. Our brothers and sisters in Gaza, the number one issue they feel other than the fact that they're having this massive crime committed against them, is that the world doesn't care. That the, their children's lives don't matter. That these crimes against these beautiful, innocent children, that for the rest of their lives they have to endure this heart, this permanent disability, it's being done because they're not human beings. Their lives don't matter. If these were Ukrainian kids, imagine the New York Times, imagine our congressman, imagine our president screaming and shouting and talking about it. Well, they're Palestinian kids, and their lives don't matter. We're going to reverse that. We bring out people, they cheer them, they show them the love, and it's a community support for them. He's gonna be here from, she's already been here for several months. She's now going to school in Chicago. Um, she's gonna learn English, and I told her today, chat GPT is great, you can just translate into Arabic. So I sent her a text. I want her to be inspiring for this boy. I want her to be an example for this girl, because she walks them. She's, when we had a boy arrive two weeks ago in Chicago, who also was missing both of his legs, she was the first one who greeted him, walking and showing him, hey, look at me, I'm like you, I lost my legs, I'm your age, and after a few months, I'm walking again. I want these kids to be ambassadors for other kids, and I want them to be ambassadors for their people, so that when they come to this country, our fellow citizens here can see them and understand that they are human beings that this dehumanization that has been going on for generations, this idea that Muslims are terrorists, that Arabs are uncivilized, that they're not like us, is not only false, it's racist, and it's, it's completely against what we as human beings should accept in 2024 as any kind of modern discourse. It's unacceptable. Anybody who's been to the Middle East knows that they're the most kind, hospitable, decent people, the Arab, Muslim, and Christian population there, of anywhere in the world. They're just like Midwesterners, but even better. Because if you go to their home, you're gonna get fed. If you go to their home, you're not going anywhere until they lavish you with hospitality. We're a little bit like that, but not quite to the extent. So the fact that this whole image of Arabs and Muslims has been allowed to be created in this country, it's not by accident. The only way you can commit genocide and occupy their land and force them into refugee camps and do that for generations is by you create this idea that they're not equal that they're not like us, that they're different. We're civilized, we're democratic, they're not. They like dictatorships. They have four wives, they're just, uh, they're barbarians. They cut off each other's heads, you know? That's the images they want to create and it's just contrary to the reality. So, these kids are ambassadors. One thing we're going to do with them is give them language skills so they can go out next time, in one year, next year, she's gonna come and talk about, tell you her story in English. It's not gonna be me. I want them to be the voice of their people, not me. I'm not their voice. I'm just somebody who's here to show you as Americans that we are responsible and that we have ways to, to do something positive for these kids. Next slide, please. That's our global healing program. We have more kids coming. Oh, that's a blank one. Keep going. Oh, okay. So I think we can click on this and play the video of, this is one of the kids that we um, brought for treatment to Chicago. Can you, does this play? Oh, that's awesome. Oh, skip that. You too. Can you pause, pause this for just a second? The media is, is, this is the battleground in this country, right? Changing the hearts and minds of our people here, our American brothers and sisters who have no connection to that region. This is the struggle. Because as soon as people like all of us in this room realize that we're responsible for this, the sooner the policy is going to change and we're going to stop supporting it. But one thing I want you to see, this is the boy who arrived, the boy who arrived a couple weeks in Chicago, how it was covered in the local media there. All four media stations came out and did a story about it. This is one of them. And also uh, that you'll see Leanne, the girl who I said wanted to meet, meet, met him first. Notice that she came and greeted him and as a symbol of inspiration uh, and what he could become if, uh, once he starts his treatment. Oh no, sorry, this is a different kid. But the person who meets this boy works for me. Her name is Sabrine. Sorry, 
So she is, came on a Fulbright scholarship in September, one month before the genocide, to Kent, Ohio, where I'm from. And as a Gazan, when the genocide started, she's from Han Yunus in Gaza. When the genocide started, she was stuck here. Uh, her family's in Gaza. And she started searching, at what organization can I volunteer for? And she was shocked to find that there's one literally half a mile away in this small Ohio town. She, was, she contacted us, and now she's one of our main persons who's dealing with the kids from Gaza. And her brother was killed in a bombing back in March, so she's also suffered immensely, and her family's completely displaced, and she has a hard time reaching them. If you could play this video. That's a short story, and it was, I think it, you know, when Americans see that, hopefully it starts to change their perception of the situation. The next slide. And we've done these on every kid that's come. We have the community come and meet them. We invite the media. We want them to see. We want the Palestinians to see they're not alone. We stand with them, and we want the world to see what's happening to these kids. We have a mental health program. We already talked about the effects of six wars on the kids who are 16 years old in Gaza. We're trying to deal with that through counseling, through therapy, through support for them, both in Gaza right now, but also for displaced children in Egypt. That's one of our programs in the H pillar of health. Next slide, please. Um, and we're running makeshift classrooms. As I mentioned already, 93% uh, of Gaza's 560 schools have either been destroyed or damaged, and 340 have been directly bombarded by the Israeli army. Um, Heal Palestine, we're opening makeshift classrooms. Next slide, please. And these classrooms look, you know, they're tents. That's all we can afford right now. Anytime you build, you can't rebuild a physical structure. Um, but you know, we're doing our best to hire teachers and get these kids back into some kind of learning environment. The damage that missing a year of school or two years of school on a child is permanent. You can't bring them back and accelerate a tutoring program and make up that time. It affects their brain, it affects their development, which never they never recover from. So again, these crimes are not just physical crimes, they're crimes that are affecting the spirit and the mentality and the ability of our children in the future to become, to heal from what they've experienced. Next slide, please. And so in addition to that, we run a field hospital, as I mentioned before, that treats thousands of people every week. Um, and we are uh, providing clean water and a lot of other things. So you go to our website and see that. I'm gonna end it here, because I've talked a lot and I apologize again. I, I think I spoke over what I said I was going to, Michael, apologies. Um, but I, I think it's an important issue, and I think it deserves the opportunity to be able to talk about it in a kind of comprehensive way. Not only what's happening there on the ground and the impact that it's having on Gaza's one million children, but also what can we do about it? What's our response? What are we going to do to take ownership of this responsibility that our government has placed on our shoulders by funding and supporting actively genocide? There's so much we can do. Organizations like HEAL, obviously, I've demonstrated to you by feeding people, by bringing injured kids here, by providing all kinds of different services on the ground there. There's many things that we can do. It's also our responsibility to try to communicate and educate the, our fellow brothers and sisters here in Indiana and in Ohio, where I'm from, and all over the country, especially in the Midwest, because people don't seem to understand this issue in a realistic sense that not only are we responsible for these children's deaths and for this ongoing genocide, but it's taking money out of our pockets that can be used to improve the quality of life. In Israel, they have free health care. We don't have free health care here. They have free education at a higher level. You can go to university in Israel for free. We don't have that in this country. 
we give them a higher standard of living and a higher quality of life than we have for ourselves in this country. How does that make sense? How is that even possible? And at the same time, we're supporting the genocide that's starving children, that's killing them every day, either by bombing them or denying them medical care, or denying them access to treatment. We're destroying their minds by bombing their schools and shutting down the education system and destroying their universities. And nobody is speaking out on it. This is such a human issue. It's not even a political one. No one from any political orientation, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, whatever your background is, this should not be an issue that any, that should be controversial or even debatable. It's wrong, it's injustice, and it has to stop. And it has to stop here. The Israelis are not going to do it. They are out of control. We've given a machine gun to a maniac, and they're using it. And we keep giving them more bullets, and more bullets, and more bullets, and they keep shooting it and using that on innocent people. We have to stop providing them those bullets. It's our responsibility. We have to take a stand. So what are we going to do? Be active. Support organizations. It doesn't have to be Heal Palestine. We welcome your support. But if it's not us, if it's somebody else, be active. Get involved with the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. I'm sure they would love to have more volunteers. Bring more speakers here. Get voices of Palestinians out into your community. When you start to hear them speak, they're much more articulate than me, and it's their cause. It's their country. Bring them and let them speak. There's hundreds of doctors who've been there and have come back and tell stories. Listen to them, share that, get that into the newspaper, and don't be intimidated by these accusations of anti-Semitism. Speaking out for freedom and justice and equality, which is what the Palestinian issue is about, is not anti-Semitic. Our Jewish and brothers and sisters in this country stand with us every day more and more. They've shut down Congress. They've shut down Central Station in New York City, our Jewish brothers and sisters. They know that this issue is not one of anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism. It's one in which this concept of Zionism, that you have the right to go to another people's land and take it and provide privileges to your people and deny that rights and equality to the indigenous population, that's a wrong ideology. That's what the basis of Zionism. It's not anti-Semitism. It's justice. So don't be afraid. Don't be intimidated. That accusation of anti-Semitism, it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't work. It's a weakness. It's cowardly. It's the last thing they have to try to shut us up. We will never shut up. We know the truth. You've seen it. It's much worse than what I've shown you. And we have a responsibility. As free men and women, born in this great country, with so many rights and privileges that our forefathers died and sacrificed for, storming the beaches of Normandy and so many other places that they gave their lives, they would be ashamed today, those veterans, if they saw our government supporting the killing of innocent children. So do not be intimidated. Stand up, take a stand, and support organizations that are doing good work. Thank you guys for having me today. Apologize for, <laughs> apologize for speaking to you. We have time for questions. Steve, uh, thank you so much. Tony? Talk about the universities being just. Yeah, Steve, we need you to. We oh, need to use the mic, mic here. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Okay. And then uh, repeat, sure. the question. repeat the question. So he's asking me, you're asking me why the universities were bombed? Yeah, okay. I think part of, and I mentioned this before, I think part of, of the Israeli intention has always been a, a significant part of the Israeli political establishment has been to push the Arab population out of Palestine. We saw it in 1948. They did it under the, you know, when it was much easier to ethnically cleanse people from their land. But in 2024, it's not as easy. You have to create conditions in which people want to leave. So you create an unlivable environment. The United Nations said that by 2020, Gaza, the world's largest open air prison, again a quote from the United Nations, that it would be unlivable. Well, it is unlivable today. Not only because it's been massively destroyed, but all of the social foundation of that society has also been destroyed. 
You destroy universities, you destroy the ability for people to think, the ability for people to be educated, for people to have the skill set intellectually to help rebuild their country. And that's what happened, and that's the intention here is part of this genocide is to destroy the Palestinian spirit, the Palestinian society, their social infrastructure, and that starts with higher education. We were to, yeah, sure, Fred, please. Can you just repeat the question? Yeah. I have two responses as to what the best response is or best method of dealing with our political leaders in Washington and in Indianapolis. I think first of all to engage them and to let them know that you have another voice. I went to Washington, we had two doctors stuck in Gaza. They were there on a, on a humanitarian mission in October when the, um, um, when the genocide began and they were stuck there for a month. So I went to Washington with the families of these doctors and tried to get our congressmen and women to advocate for their ability to cross into Egypt and leave. And what I saw on Capitol Hill was office after office after office of our elected officials with Israeli flags outside. Um, and that in some ways it just indicated that their allegiance is even more to another country than their own. Um, so I think the system in Washington is, and what I also saw was a lot of people from that side going around trying to engage the uh, congressmen and senators with their point of view on the issue, but they need to hear from our side. So when they come to your community and they want your vote, tell them your vote's conditioned, conditioned on the fact that they have to take a stand on genocide. It could be supporting an arms embargo or not even allowing our arms to be used in Gaza. Israel can have our arms to defend itself from threats of Iran, but they can't use it on bombing of innocent civilians in Gaza. Just that, like isn't that a very basic request for, for your elected officials? That's important, but I, my personal view is that the system is so deeply compromised by lobby money and by big money that you know even today, we know that a recent poll came out that three-fourths of the Democrats support a arms embargo on Israel, three-fourths, 75%, and yet, the Democratic leadership 100% denies that and is willing to supply weapons and will continue to supply weapons regardless or irregardless of whether their constituents have a strong view on this or not, and they do. So the system's broken, and that's why, you know, when I was a young man, I decided to go on this path and not on a political route because I still believe that big money plays such a significant role, it diminishes our democracy to the extent that our leaders don't truly represent us. They represent those who are their donors and their funders and their lobbyists. That doesn't mean we don't engage them, let them know that we're here, that our voice matters, and that we are representing a side that represents our values as Americans, but don't have high expectations that the system's going to change because there's so much money coming in to them from the other side to get them to ignore their responsibilities as human beings and as elected officials. When we were together today, um, you were on the phone, and the comment that you made was, genocide and polio, who would have thought we'd be talking about that in 2024? Yeah. You want to say a word about polio, but also just that comment? Yeah, so there's been an outbreak of polio in Gaza, as many, many of you know. That's a result of the Israelis bombing the water waste, wastewater treatment plants and denying clean water from entering Gaza. Uh, Gaza itself does not have any um, aquifers that are accessible with clean water. Even before October 7th, 90% of the water in Gaza when you turned on the tap was undrinkable. People had to buy water um, to be safe. Uh, so imagine after October 7th when there's no trucks of water coming in, what people were depending on. It was this very, very um, um, salty and unsafe water and then water treatment plant is, uh, is bombed, 
open sewage in the streets, the sanitation system is broken down, it's ripe for disease. And now there's polio in Gaza, as you'll probably know, the UN asked for a one-week ceasefire to vaccinate people in Gaza against polio, and the Israelis refused. They refused to stop their killing machine for one week so the UN could go in and vaccinate children and people in general against polio. So imagine, as Michael said, I was talking to my wife, who's a pediatrician, a pediatric oncologist, who was talking to me about, well, the Jordanians are going to waive the, um, um, that the kids coming out with cancer have to be vaccinated before they come. They'll do it when they arrive in Jordan. And we were talking about it, just this idea, well, we have these kids here, 18 injured kids in this country now being treated. Mohammed, who just came uh, on Tuesday to Houston, how do, how do we get him tested to make sure he doesn't have, he doesn't carry the, the virus, that he doesn't have polio? Um, is there even a test available in this country? Polio was eradicated years, decades ago. Um, so here we are in 2024, and not only are the people in Gaza being completely decimated by our bombs, um, but now they have to worry about contracting polio. Unimaginable. I never thought when I started working in Palestine that there would be a genocide and these medieval diseases would be coming back that have to be dealt with. It's just incomprehensible. Here we are. This is 2024. This is the reality that we have to deal with. You talked about the money that is coming from Israel into the United States and it's funding the politicians. What about the money in the Arab world? Yeah. Where is that coming from or doesn't seem to be coming from? Yeah. Does that so make sense? For, first of all, the money that's supporting Israel through APAC, which is the largest lobbying group in the, in the United States is pro-Israel lobbying group. That's American money. Those are American supporters who are donating on a single issue. Like, that's the older generation of um, evangelicals and Jewish Americans who are basing their um, votes on the issue of Israel. And they are you know, attacking people. They've already defeated a couple of congressmen. They tried to defeat uh, others but lost by just pumping money into their opponents on the single issue of Israel, like nothing else matters. Um, you know, the, environmental, the environment doesn't matter, abortion doesn't matter, workers' rights don't matter, whatever. It's only Israel for them. That's all through APAC. The Arab money is limited because it's all from outside, right? Saudi money, Emirati money, Kuwaiti money. And let's remember that those are not democratic regimes. Those are regimes that have been compromised by, um, by U.S. policy in the region. The Emirates, the Emirates have a peace agreement with Israel. They're not going to pump money into the American political system to change American policy on Israel because the people who are in charge there don't care that much about this issue. The same in Saudi Arabia, the same in Bahrain, the same in um, Oman, the same in Qatar. Kuwait is more pro-Palestinian than the others, but staying. These are not democratic regimes that care about the welfare of the Palestinian people. Otherwise, they wouldn't deny them medical care in their country. I tried to send two injured children to the Dubai. I had a hospital that was willing to accept them for treatment. I had a doctor who was willing to waive his surgical fees to treat these two sisters whose mom was killed, and I, we were willing to take care of them. The Emirates said, no, we're not issuing them a visa. So these Arab countries, they have vast wealth, of course, unimaginable wealth. Saudi exports 10 million barrels of oil a day, Emirates 2.4, so on and so forth. They're not, they don't care about the welfare of the Palestinians. They care about keeping themselves in power because they're not democratically elected. So the Ameri our security systems are protecting them and providing them the security that they need to continue to rule undemocratically in their countries. It's not an issue for them. Palestine is not an issue in them insofar as it doesn't challenge or undermine their uh, ruling power and their positions of leadership in their country. Anyone else? Oh. I'm wondering, in engaging our family, our friends, in understanding the genocide that's happening, many, I think most of us, 
we'll hear in response, well, Hamas is hiding themselves, you know, among the people, almost as though that, was, that makes it okay. So then you can return with, clearly, Israel has demonstrated that they're able to take out tar their um, target, a leader or target captors of the Israeli uh, or Israeli hostages without taking out a lot of other people. But how would you, well, first of all, is it even true that Hamas is hiding among, you know, families and schools, schools hospitals. and hospitals? Yeah. And um, I guess in my mind, I think of the Israeli government and what they have, the genocide that they're carrying out right now. And you said that 40% of the population is so young. Yeah, under 16. And I just think, how do they think that these people are going to respond in a way that is not creating, you know, they'll be the next fighters. They'll be the next people that are resistant. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what Elon Musk said at the beginning of this uh, genocide. He was saying they're just creating more Hamas through their methods of, of indiscriminate killing. And that's true. Not to quote Elon Musk. He's not a hero of mine. But he made a very kind of uh, important point, which is this use of indiscriminate killing uh, has created a whole new uh, cadre of, of Hamas supporters and future fighters who have nothing to lose who are willing to go into tunnels. Gaza, we all know, and the America, if you look at some of the American security papers that have come out about this conflict in Gaza, the Israelis are not winning this war. Um, they're winning in the sense that they've destroyed a lot of buildings, they've killed a lot of people, they've left the entire society decimated. But if you follow, you can see that every day they're suffering still casualties. Even in areas that they so-called cleansed months ago, there's still a strong resistance and an organized resistance. Uh, there's a group called the Electronic Intifada out of Chicago and every week they do a um, uh, kind of a lecture online about the Palestinian resistance. And it's very interesting because they show videos that come from the Palestinian resistance and they, they show that how they are still operating using computers, setting ambushes, having a very structured resistance method in areas like Rafah, in areas like Beit Hanun in the northeast of the Gaza Strip, which is right on the Israeli border, in which is still causing immense casualties on the Israelis. The, the recent report in the Israeli newspaper was that there's been 10,000 Israeli casualties in Gaza. They've only reported 2,000 or 2,500. So we all know that that's not accurate numbers. Um, to say that Hamas is hiding in these schools and in these hospitals. They've not proven that. They've not documented that. They bombed a hospital, sorry, they bombed a school a week ago that led, when women were praying, women and children were praying in Fajr prayer, which is that when the sun comes up for Muslims, they pray. And they killed o over 100 people praying. And they made a claim that they killed 18 Hamas people. And then they released the names. And when they studied the names that were released, they found that some of the names were people who were actually killed in the West Bank a week or two ago. So it's not accurate. And there isn't any verifiable proof that Hamas is using human shields. Now, they're in one of the most densely populated areas of the world and that is even more dense than before because people are being pushed more and more into certain areas by violence. Um, and so I suspect that probably they are among the population, but I don't see that as justification for dropping 2,000 pound bombs on a school uh, where m women and children are praying Fajr prayer. Uh, I think it's a weak argument, and I don't think it underscores the root issue here. It's not about Hamas or about um, um, how to eradicate Hamas. It's how do you make peace in a conflict that's been going on since 1948 and even before that. How do we come to a final resolution 
to this problem so it doesn't keep coming up again and again and worse and worse and igniting potentially a more global conflict. We now see with Iran this potential for war. We all see in southern Lebanon a potential for war. This is not just an isolated geographical conflict. It could potentially ignite into something that gets out of control very easily. So how do we go about resolving this issue finally once and for all? You force both parties to sit down and you come to a resolution in which people share the land equally. You can have a confederation like they have in Belgium between the Flemish speaking part and the uh, French speaking part where you almost, it's two different countries actually, even economically, but they're one confederated political entity. You can be creative in resolving this issue, but you can't continue on with an occupation that denies people equality in their own land. You cannot, it's unsustainable. It doesn't matter how many settlements you build, how many highways you put that are for Jews only, how many barbed wires and walls that you build, eventually all of that's going to crumble down through violence and conflict unless you have an equitable, just solution. That's what has to happen now. That's what's missing in the international community, the application of UN resolutions and international law that says enough, enough. The idea of continued superior rule by one people over another in 2024 cannot continue. We have to have equality, freedom, and justice for everyone. That's what the Palestinians are asking for. And if our relatives, our neighbors don't understand that, ask them, what if you were Palestinian? What would you do? Peacefully demonstrate they've tried that and they get shot and killed. I've seen it. We've all seen it. What could you expect them to do? What options are they? They sat down in Oslo in 1993 and they were promised that they would have a state. They would promise that the settlements would be removed. And all that we saw was a 200% increase in settlements over the next 10 years. And this massive movement of Israelis into the West Bank to further take their land, to further deny them um, the ability to build a state. So what do we expect the Palestinians to do? What would you do if you, as a free American, or as, as, a, as a human being, saw your land being taken? And you were denied, right, you would resist. Our forefathers resisted over much less injustice. They suffered from, uh, uh, from taxes. No taxation without representation. That's nothing compared to what the Palestinians have been enduring for generations. And our forefathers, and we glorify them, as we should. So it's very hypocritical for any American to say the Palestinians have no right to resist. We can talk about their methods of resistance. I don't support the use of violence in, in, in any way. But I certainly don't support it, any violence against innocent civilians. But for us to say they have no right to resist is hypocritical and contrary to international law. In international law, an occupied people have the right to resist. I just want to say that very powerful speaker and I think that after hearing you that you are the grassroots movement that I've been looking for and I myself intend to do everything I can to support you and to support the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to hear that. I hope all of you support the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. This is a great organization, and we're very proud to, to be partners here today with them and hopefully having a future partnership as well. Thank you. Yes, sir, please. Yes. So um, you rightfully mentioned that it's not mostly Jewish support in the U.S., but Christian evangelical support that's causing a lot of the atrocities and the lobbying. Yeah. So what would you say can be done to like reduce their influence or make them kind of reflect on what their ideologies are causing on the Palestinian people? Like I know there's uh, evangelical churches in Fort Wayne, you know, who are telling people about the rapture and yeah. that, you know, so. So he's asking about the evangelical issue. And that's really, it's kind of ironic because 
if you know the, what the intentions of the evangelical movement is, it's to have conflict, the, like the um, end of days, Armageddon, in evangelical Christian theology, is that the Jews have to go back, they all have to return to Israel, and there's going to be a great war, and the Messiah is going to come down, and either they all have to be converted to Christianity, or they have to be killed, the Jews. So it's not, if I was an Israeli, I'd be like, you're not really on my side. <laughs> you know, you just want the Messiah to come back. Um, so that's an irony of the issue, but you find also the evangelicals in this country are the least um, open to having a conversation about this issue. Because for them, it doesn't matter if kids are being killed. It doesn't matter if international law is being ignored or violated. It doesn't matter if we're even using our tax money to pay for this and to support it. What matters for them is that Israel is being supported so that they can reach their evangelical uh, agenda, the, the focus of what, how they see the second coming of Jesus as it's in, um, what is it, the book of, what's the book of, uh, at the end, the rapture? Uh, Revelation, sorry, I should know that I'm in church. Um, because uh, I'm in a church. <laughs> it's funny, I was went to CCD and didn't learn anything about the Bible for years. Um, so that's the irony of it. Now, they're not allies, obviously, and they're the people who, you know, are willing to turn a blind eye to insurrection. They're the people who are willing to do anything to get their um, political agenda kind of imposed on the American political system. Um, and I don't know what to say to them because the fact that the Palestinians have a significant Christian minority not, you know, not only in Palestine, although it's less and less than before, but within the Palestinian community all over the world, um, Christians play a very significant role. And they're being abused and suffering in Bethlehem and in Christian towns in the West Bank. And we saw what happened to the Christian population in Gaza just as much as the Muslims are. But that doesn't resonate with the evangelicals because they don't care because that's part of the whole kind of process of reaching the point of the end days. Um, I don't know what to say to them. I, I wish I did um, because it's a tough discussion. If you can see the kids being killed every day and, this, and fathers holding up their dead children and sobbing and that doesn't move you as a so-called Christian, um, then I don't think any words from me is going to have any impact or any of us for that matter. Are the, are the Palestinian people getting any kind of aid from any of the surrounding countries like Egypt, Jordan? Is there any assistance in reference to you know, humanitarian aid? Yeah, that's a great question and the answer is yes. Uh, so Egypt has taken thousands of injured Palestinians from Gaza into their hospitals. And, um, and that's in a country that's going through a huge economic crisis in Egypt. Their currency has devalued significantly in the past couple years. Um, they're, you know, suffering from a huge amount of economic uh, issues in that country, and yet they've provided free medical care for injured Gazans in the public health sector there. It's not great care because public care in a lot of the countries in that region is not at a high level, but it saved a lot of lives, and I have respect for the Egyptian Ministry of Health for providing that care. Um, they've also sent tens of millions and probably more than that of aid into Gaza. Same with Jordan. Um, they are all, the people there, the people of the Middle East, contrary to the regimes quite frequently, are very pro-Palestinian. In fact, it's the number one issue in Jordan, in Egypt, in Lebanon, in a, the entire Arabian Gulf, Persian Gulf, pa the Palestinian issue is the number one among the people. But it's not reflective in their government policies. In Jordan and Egypt, because they're bordering Palestine and because there's lots of Palestinians, especially in Jordan, it's like 70% Palestinian or more, um, they have to at least show gestures of goodwill. And they've done more than that. They've sent a lot of aid. The Jordanians even had a military hospital. It's still open in Gaza, operating with Jordanian doctors. So they've done a lot. Um, it, it, but 
Could they do more? Yeah, but it's also hypocritical for me as an American to complain about the Jordanian or the Egyptian government when what our government's doing is minuscule in comparison to what their governments are doing to help provide food, medical care, and humanitarian aid. Say a word about Israel's uh, access for uh, Gazans to medical care. Uh, there's a hospital of uh, Augusta Victoria uh, in Jerusalem, there's, and there's other facilities that are available in, in Israel proper. And Israeli citizens, unlike American citizens, have universal health care. They do. Uh, and we're sending billions of dollars of weapons to Israel gratis, free of charge from us. Uh, say a word about what uh, Israel does when you ask them to get a child out or a cancer victim out for treatment. So traditionally, because I'm not going to talk about Gaza patients, I'll talk about Palestinians who are under occupation in the West Bank and Gaza. They have had traditionally access to Israeli hospitals, but they had to pay. There was no free care unless you're an Arab with Israeli citizenship. Because you're an, a citizen inside 1948 borders of Israel, you have access to Israeli health services as an Israeli citizen. Uh, but at, include settlers, though, too. Yeah, of course, know. of course. Or Jewish citizens who are living in settlements in the West Bank, good point. Um, but for Palestinians, who are an equal in population from the West Bank and Gaza, the only way they can get access to Israeli health services is through a referral process. Now, what's been going on in this process is that the Israelis collect VAT taxes for Palestinian imports through their, board, through their ports of Haifa and Eshdod. So when Palestinians in the West Bank import goods, they collect a VAT tax, and then they transfer that to the Palestinian Authority. But before they transfer it, they deduct money for the patients that have been transferred to Israeli hospitals. So if they have a $200 million tax bill that they owe the Palestinians because it's their money on the VAT taxes of goods and services that are coming in and going out of uh, their economy through Israeli ports, they will deduct $50 million or $60 million. And that's often not audited. The U.S. government tried to audit those claims of, okay, I treated a kid with cancer in a hospital in Israel. What did that cost? Well, it's not itemized. It was never something that was fixed in an audited bill. So even those numbers can be highly inflated, and most likely they are. So Palestinians don't have, they do get treatment in Israeli hospitals, but at a cost. One of the things that has always been common, and you'll hear it a lot from Israelis, is that we treat their patients. Yeah, you treat their patients, they're paying for it. We treat patients also from Mexico here if they pay for it. If you're a Russian, you can come here and get treatment if you pay for it. That's not something to hang your hat on as an American. Um, now, we're sending medical teams into Gaza, and Michael just reminded me about this because it changed. This morning I woke up and had a call with our team that's preparing for a mission of doctors to go in. And just recently, because the um, access into Gaza changed from the Egyptian Rafah crossing, which is where teams were going into Gaza, when they closed that crossing in early May because of the invasion of Rafah by the Israeli army, missions started coming in through Jordan and through Israel. And the Israelis then had a much stronger hand in creating policies on how those teams could come in. And just recently they created, where before you could send in a team of 20 surgeons to go to whatever hospitals are left in Gaza and provide medical care which is otherwise not available. Once it switched to Jordan through Israel, the Israelis imposed that organizations like ours could only have teams of four every two months. So before you could send an unlimited number, now you can only send four, and they have to stay one month. So good luck finding a doctor who has one month off. Now we do have some, but it's much harder restriction. They have to stay one month, there's only four of them allowed, and by the way, none of them can have any ethnic ties uh, to Palestine. Their great grandfather could have emigrated from Bethlehem here, and you could be one of the top surgeons in your community, if your great-grandfather emigrated here, you're not allowed to go to Gaza and provide surgery. Even if you don't speak Arabic, even if you've never been to Palestine in your entire life, you can't go. And just today we found that 
now they're not even going to allow missions in for organizations that have uh, are not on a certain list. So literally, we were sending a team over on Saturday, and then we found out today that our team is being postponed until this policy is clarified by the Israelis, because they're basically saying, you can't send these doctors in anymore. So it's very complicated. It's very confusing. Um, in addition to that, um, every doctor has to be approved by the Israeli administrative and the Shin Beit, which is kind of like um, the CIA. Uh, for is No, it's like the FBI, sorry. The Shin Beit's internal, the Mossad external. So in this country, the CIA is external and the FBI is internal security. So the Shin Beit in Israel, which is like the FBI, has to approve every doctor. And if you wrote something on social media that you're, um, hey, you know, stop the genocide or whatever, there's a good chance they're going to not let you in to Gaza as an orthopedic surgeon or a plastic surgeon or any kind of doctor because of your position on this issue. So this is what we're facing. Every day becomes more complicated. We have five kids now, five kids in Gaza who we've ex we have accepted for free care in the U.S. over the past couple of months. They're waiting to get out, kids who've had their legs blown off, kids who have significant injuries, and we can't get them out because their mothers keep being, being denied because the mothers are security threats. Well, these are like 25-year-old moms that have no issue with security. And also, um, if they're a security threat, wouldn't you want them out, right? Why would you want them to be in Gaza? Let them go to America. They're no longer your problem. They're the problem of, of the Americans. So this is the restrictions that exist. There's a lot more than that. But just to bring it to light here in this room, it's extremely challenging to do any kind of work right now in humanitarian aid. We're doing everything we can to help people there. We're not a political organization in the sense that we help people based on their nationality, based on their religion, based on any political reasons. We help people based on their need. Um, but in a highly politicized issue, like I mentioned earlier, everything is political. The water is political. Medical care is political. Education is political. Everything is political. And it makes it very hard for us to stay focused on a humanitarian air issue when even providing medical care for an injured child is a political act. But that's the world that we're dealing with right now, and we have to continue because these kids need our help. Let's say thanks to Steve. Thanks for having me.